going to do a little, let's test this out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's it again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> the hare said to the tortoise, you have very funny feet and an ungainly walk. The tortoise said, I'll beat you in a race. The hare said, you got me kidding. I can dance around you the whole race and still easily win. And so they set off on the race. The hare rapidly ran ahead and soon was out of sight of the tortoise and decided, I've got so much of a head start, I'll just lay down and take a nap. When the hare woke up, he saw that the tortoise was almost at the finish line and run as hard as he might he could not catch up and the tortoise won. Slow and steady win the race. That's one of Aesop's fables, written around 600 BC. Now, I noticed that there's kind of a wide diversity of ethnic cultures in the room. If you know this story, say yes. 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 Okay, excellent. Everybody knows it. In, in fact, Three centuries later, third century BC, uh, a similar saying shows up in Ecclesiastes, verse nine, chapter uh, chapter nine, verse eleven. The race does not belong to the swift. Again, slow and steady win the race. Now, here's the good part. And this is why I'm actually talking about this. Because you, and you, you, you back there. You and you. In fact, all of you, by virtue of even being here and listening to these, these ideas and part of this intellectual stimulation, you're all hares. You're not the tortoise. So how does it feel to have 23 centuries rooting against you? <laughs> Betting that you're going to do something like lay down, take a nap, and blow the race. It's kind of something different to think about. What's interesting about this, we've already heard about how slow and steady can mean that you can see wildlife, experience the world in a very different way. What does it mean for you? You're at a great place. For those of you who are in school here at the Davidson Academy, it provides a tremendous gift because you're given enough work, hard work. You learn how to analyze and think and write all the three R's in a way where not only do you learn this body of knowledge and this way of thinking, but you also get to experience how to work steadily, how to manage your time, how to manage your energy. This is managing yourself, this steadiness. That's what the hair didn't have, what you are getting. It's a wonderful thing, tremendous gift. What about the slow part? Let's talk a little bit about that. It turns out, unless you're on the Pacific Crest or riding your bicycle to the Bering Strait, that you're going to be working with people. We've heard about that a couple of times, that you're really working with people. And some of you might be thinking, you know, no, 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 I'm not going to work with people. I'm going to, I'm going to go be a doctor, I'm going to be a scientist. I don't have to work with people. And somebody's laughing. <laughs> and I bet you're a doctor. <laughs> because one of the things that happens, it's, it's, it, it, it's, uh, it's sad but true, that in medical school, you're trained how to diagnose, you're trying, trying to figure out how to analyze the symptoms or whatever is wrong with the patient so you can create care. What you're not trained how to do is how to effectively work with people. I think, I don't know if there are any nurses in here, but you could probably testify that doctors are not trained in this vein. Or some of the doctors in here probably testify that some of your colleagues are not trained how to work with people. And, and the sad part about this is, is that you get the best medical care if you can effectively work with people. So this ability to work with people, it, it's coming, coming at you no matter what. Uh, unless, even, even if you are on the Pacific Crest 
trail hiking for half the year. As Adam was saying, the other half of the year he was doing something he didn't really like very much, so he could go back out and be by himself. So still half the year he's working with people. So what is it about slow and steady that might make working with people relevant and make the story about the tortoise and the hare important to you? Well, it turns out that one of the most popular companies to work for is pretty close by. It's Google. Last year, they were ranked number one as the most popular place to work for in the United States. What does that mean? You know, number one, it's not like you won the Super Bowl. Number one meant they had 4,000 openings last year. They had 1,292,000 applications for those 4,000 job openings. It's pretty steep competition. Not only that, the guys at Google are by the way, I use guys just as a kind of general thing. It's not to mean that they're all men working here. The men and women who are working at Google are very interested in data. And you might also expect when, you, when you're trying to sort through more than 1.2 million applications, you want to know, how do, we, how do we choose the best people? Is it random? Should we just throw them in the air and pull out randomly? Should we pick otherwise? And so they've been measuring this for some time, trying to figure out how do we pick the best employees. The results that they've been looking at are kind of illuminating, given the discussions we've had today about how to slow down and how to work on being fearless. GPAs are worthless. Test scores, except for the recent college graduates, not very good predictors of how people are going to perform and Google's employees. Now, so for those of you, especially the young people who are still in school, this is not necessarily good news for you because these things are what hairs are good at in school, GPAs and test scores. And Google is telling you, that's not why we're gonna hire you. That's not a good discriminator. Now the other bad news are interesting news. I guess the other thing the way to look at it is this opportunity. Is that other companies are looking at this too. This is not just a Google issue. This is an international issue. In fact, as recently as just a few months ago, this study was published where they looked at data from 36 different organizations. Is that right? That's right. 36 different organizations. And they found that more than half of the leaders that were hired from outside the company, brought into the company, failed. Failed. This is not some random, you know, let's just pick somebody out of the street and hire them to be a manager. They spent a lot of time and effort. It is painful to have this person fail. Not only do they fail, it's painful for them, it's painful for the people watching, it's painful for the people working with them. They could take a whole organization down by failing. It is expensive. Not a good thing to do. So there are a lot of organizations trying to figure out what things do we need to look at? What are the dimensions we need to look at to be successful? What's important? In 1983, Howard Gardner, who's on the lower left, published a seminal book on multiple intelligences. And by the way, I'm not a psychologist, and I'm not having no training in this one, but the manual is pretty badly, and oversimplify a lot of things, and I really apologize to them. people <laughs> who know about this more than I do. But the important thing is that, that Howard Gardner really said that there's more intelligence that's out there than we can really measure on an IQ test. The IQ test is this gross simplification of people who can do read and write and arithmetic, and not all the other things we need to do to succeed in life. In the 90s, this was followed by Daniel Goleman and Ruben Barong, who wrote about social and emotional intelligence. And again, here's the gross oversimplification. They're, they're really writing about how do we interact with people, how do we interact with ourselves, how are we aware of our emotions, how do we interact socially, what is our IQ or EQ in that area? And what I really like is, well, I was uh, doing research on this, Somebody described Ruben on Mars' work as coming about because he was so perplexed by the number of very smart people 
that came to see him in his clinical practice who made dumb mistakes. Why do smart people make dumb mistakes? Was what he was trying to answer. He's trying to solve the fable. Why did the hair lose? Or why do hairs lose? Why would any of you lose? What happens here? This is where slow comes in, I think, for our ability to see things. So let me give you a story. It is definitely not as thrilling as throwing yourself backwards over <laughs> under, under a, a shelf of rock and trying to catch yourself, which I would suck at. <laughs> but this could be scary in another way. This is uh, a sea cucumber dish. It's uh, a Chinese delicacy. Um, it, it's very similar to the picture, it's very similar to, to the kind my mother cooks, which is uh, sea cucumber, pork, and uh, bamboo shoots. When I went off to college and came back for the first time, uh, my mother had been thinking about what to serve. Or, or, I'm the oldest son, so I'm the oldest kid here. I went off to college, I'm coming back, and now I'm a, kind of a guest in the house. And what am I serving? You know, I want him to be happy and impress him. So she cooked sea cucumber for me, because it was not something we ate usually. And um, Those of you who have been to college, know that when you first come back home and get a home-cooked meal for the first time, you eat everything. It tastes great. It's like, oh my god, it's not dorm food. Those of you who have been to college, you will appreciate this one day. And so I'm eating this up, and I'm, I'm enjoying it, and, and, and my mother's explaining how you actually make this dish, sea cucumbers. So, there's this intermediate, you know, after they're, they're caught, they're dried. And when you, when you cook the sea cucumber, you actually have to soak it in water and then throw the water out. And then the next day, you soak it in water again and throw the water out. You do this over and over again. Then you boil it and throw the water out. I think you might have to boil it a few more times before it's reasonably edible. And then you cook it. And my mother is describing this process to me. And even through my thick head, I get this, you know, I can, uh, I can appreciate it. She's worked really hard on this dish. So what do I do? I compliment her. Mom, this is delicious. It's great. Thank you so much for making it. And for her, and for a lot of you who have these analytical, kind of very good problem-solving thinking brains, you're going to recognize this. It was like, bing, 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 double jeopardy. I know the answer. The category is, what is what are Ernie's favorite foods? The question is, what is sea cucumber? <laughs> so something interesting happened. I came home on my next trip, and my mother says, I made your favorite dish, <laughs> sea cucumber. <laughs> this is where it might get a little scary. Some of you are out there are Chinese. And you know, I was a, a, a good son, and I was ravenous and a college student and deprived of food, so I ate everything the first time when I was home. In Chinese culture, what does it mean when you clean your plate? What does it mean? Clean your plate. You want more. Right. So my mother said, and you ate everything last time, so I cooked twice as much. <laughs> We have plenty for that. You eat away. Well, this went on for my next trip home. My next trip home. It became a game around the dinner table. I have a brother and sister, and they would say, Oh, no, I can't have any of that. That's Bernie's fail. <laughs> you know, he's not home. He, he doesn't get this food all the time, so we'll save it all for him. Uh, this went on for 20 years. <laughs> you know, this, is, this is part of the danger of, of this thinking that I have the answer, this, this belief. You know, how many of you have seen little kids in the classroom when they have the answers? Like, oh, 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 I have the answer. Call on me, call on me. Oh, didn't call on me. You know, it's exciting. It's exciting to have the right answer. It's exciting to, to watch the game show and play along and, 
and beat the guy who's playing. For my mother, she had the answer. Now, so just to wrap up the story, I did eventually say, Mom, I've changed. <laughs> it's me, it's not you. Sea cucumber's no longer my favorite food. And she said, Thank God. <laughs> I've spent a year of my life eating sea cucumber. And she has never made it since. Anyway. But she was making as a type of fundamental attribution error. And I'm using this a little in a simplified way. But it's, if I figured out a correct answer, which was that I was complimenting her, and so her answer was that or he likes to cook fish. This is great. It must be the answer. This is what I should be earning every day. That is it. And it was every day. <laughs> and not only that, the right answer is the truth. What was true for his last visit is going to be true for his next visit. It's a fundamental property of the universe. It's like gravity. I should feed our AC cucumber. <laughs> I can tell from your laughter that you agree that this is not really a good way of approaching the world. But you'd be surprised how many smart people fall into this fundamental attribution error. Not only that, a lot of you, I'm included in this, if you, if you think you see an answer, you run down that path, you go for that answer. You ignore everything else. It is just like flying down the highway in your RV rather than riding down on your bicycle. You miss a lot of things. And finally, this is really not part of my talk, but I want to throw it in there anyway. But we make this error a lot, especially because all you hairs out there are so fast and so quick and good at problem solving and remembering things. You think everything should be this easy. If it's not that easy, I'm not cut out for it. And what you have now is a real opportunity to have the courage to try and do things and step out and say, you know, I said I was going to do it. <coughs> I sucked that first time. I'm going to try again. <clears throat> so given all that I've said about sea cucumbers and slow and steady winning the race, what should I do to be successful? And this is where, again, your analytical problem-solving minds are really not going to be happy with what I have to tell you. Because <laughs> there are no good answers. If it was that easy, Google would have figured it out. They'd be measuring it. There would be papers on what you should do. There would be a class that they would send about. These are the five things you need to work on. The difference, though, I do have some suggestions. So, so first of all, you know, we heard today that context is everything. And that's absolutely true. And that's why there's no one answer for anybody. Because the answer is particular to your circumstances, it's particular to who you are and who you interact with. And that's different for all of us. But what you have to do is you have to learn to slow down. And by slowing down, when you hear that right answer, that it's sea cucumber, when you hear that right answer, you have to listen for the whisper. The whisper of emotions and feelings and the things that are going on behind the scene. And if my mother had been paying attention, she would have heard those comments. She would have seen smirks <laughs> in my brother and sister's face. Like, oh, no, no, I don't want to do that. I just have a little taste and it'll be enough for me. We'll save the whole pot for her. <laughs> but, she, you know, she couldn't, she couldn't hear it. She couldn't see it. So it's listening for that whisper. And the way to start, the way to start is listening to that whisper in your own heart. You know, when you're younger, you get good at that. When you get older as adults, this is why you don't have children, so it's support groups, I assume. We, we learn how to cover it up. We learn how to disguise it. But keep that open. Keep listening. It's really critical. Slow and steady when we race. Thank you.